Donc bonjour à tous. Euh, bienvenue évidemment dans notre euh, séminaire sur l'évaluation des règles de gouvernance euh, budgétaire. Uh, I am pleased to welcome today uh, Olivier Blanchard. Hein? Olivier Blanchard um, was professor at the MIT University and Harvard University. He was chief economist of the International Monetary Fund. Hein? Um, he was also a chairman of the MIT Economic Department. And, and I forgot a lot of things, I suppose. Uh, Olivier Blanchard wrote, and I suppose he's writing, uh, a lot of paper on macroeconomic problem and issues, and particularly today on fiscal rules. And uh, it is the subject of the conference uh, today. Uh, as you, as you uh, sorry, usual, you can ask your question in the chat and uh, with uh, Chris, uh, we, we try to coordinate um, Uh, the question after uh, the presentation. Uh, Mr. Blanchard, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, well, I have, I, I see that the session is uh, two hours. That's a long time. So what I've decided to do is make a number of uh, introductory remarks. I have no clue as to whether it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, we'll see. And then we'll just open to questions if it's okay with you. Uh, I'm happy to uh, to be here, and I look forward to uh, to the questions. Uh, I actually have made uh, two slides. One is just to uh, give the title of the session, and then the next one gives you the point that I want to make. So if somebody can move it, okay. Right. Well, that's what I'm going to try to cover in my uh, in my uh, short presentation. So the first point is. Why is it that we need uh, EU rules? What are they supposed to do? And I think it's a very really important uh, question and an important answer, which is the EU rules are not there to tell governments what to do. Uh, they are there to tell governments what they cannot do. In other words, it's not about defining what the right fiscal policy is. It's just making sure that the fiscal policy doesn't run into trouble. Uh, more concretely, what is it that uh, the EU or the Eurozone as a whole cares about. Well, what it doesn't want is have one of the members. Sorry, I lost the uh, slides. Right. Sorry. OK. It's not me, but. Uh... No, tu peux repartager peut-être? Ah, il, il a perdu. Oui. C'est comme ça? Non? Vous ne l'avez plus? Non, non, on, on voit toi et M. Blanchard. OK. C'est mon ordinateur, là. I can try to share. Oh. I thought you were going to do it, but uh, let me just see. OK. Like this, it's OK? Yeah. yeah. Oh, for me, it's fair. Thank okay. you. OK, so the point is, is not, why is it that uh, the EU as a whole should care about policy in a particular country, it's they care about the probability of that default, of a country being on a path which is going to lead to sustainability issues and potentially default. Why do they care about this? Well, because default has all kinds of externalities. The financial system are incredibly linked, especially within the euro, but in the world in general, but also in the EU, in the euro. And therefore, if you have a government which basically uh, defaults, uh, this has major implications for the asset uh, uh, asset side of a number of things, uh, financial institutions and so on. But the point is that the, the rules should not be about forcing countries to follow a particular fiscal policy, but just making sure that whatever they want to do uh, is not leading uh, to a risk of, uh, of sustainability and that default. Uh, so it should be less ambitious than defining the optimal rule to take uh, a comparison with monetary policy. The EU rule is not conceptually the same thing as say, a terror rule for monetary policy. A terror rule for monetary policy is a rule which tries to get at what is the best monetary policy which should follow. That's not what this is about. This is about sure uh, that uh, countries uh, do not do anything crazy from the point of view of the others. Now, once you have these rules, 
what we should be able to do is basically do what we want up to not, not, not crossing this, this uh, threshold implied by, by the rule. So the country may well want to run deficits and it may not be an issue. The country which is more worried about the future may want to run surpluses uh, and that should not be an issue. Uh, but I, I think it's an important point because in the debate, the two are often, often mixed. So that's the first point. The second is that it's actually very easy uh, to define rules which make uh, debt sustainable, uh, uh, but there's a but. Uh, uh, why is it easy? Well, for example, black zero, uh, the rule which is used in Germany, which basically allows for only 0.35% structural deficit. Uh, you know, if you apply this rule, then almost surely debt will be, there is no issue. Uh, take the 3%, 60%, rules of a, of a Maastricht Treaty. Uh, if countries just followed those rules, uh, you know, they, that would be sustainable. Why would it be a, a very bad outcome? Because what these rules do is that they are so stringent that they basically prevent what would be reasonable fiscal pause. Uh, so, for example, you are in a deep recession and the ECB is at the uh, uh, zero lower bound, so it cannot help get the economies up. Uh, in this case, you might want, well want to have a deficit which exceeds 3%, possibly by a large amount, but the rule is there and says no, 3%. So this is an example uh, of, of, of you know, a rule which would make that sustainable, but at the cost of output, at the cost of unemployment. Uh, if you have these rules, what's going to happen? <clears throat> well, either you're going to enforce them and have bad fiscal policy, basically bad decisions, too much unemployment. And I think that's very much what happened in uh, 2009, 2013 in a number of uh, European countries. Or you're basically going to suspend the rules because it's absolutely obvious that uh, they are too stringent for the situation. So this is what the EU has done uh, for COVID. Or you're going to cheat. And uh, the history of the rules is a history of cheating. Uh, you know, with Germany and France cheating at some point. Uh, you're going to say, no, I, I can't do it. Or you're going to do try to use tricks in order to justify what you're doing. But it's going to be a mess. And so the challenge is to find rules which prevent that default. And I fully agree that that would be catastrophic while leaving the maximum amount of room for countries to do the fiscal policy that they need to do. Uh, if they have a deep recession, if they have a particular shock, if the ECB cannot help and so on. That's why it's so difficult, right? So basically, if you're absolutist, you say, okay, just simple rule, that's done, it will work, but from a macro point of view, it will be a catastrophe. Uh, and therefore, what you have to do is find the right solution. So the third point is, how do you get there? Uh, how do you basically assess whether a country is on a path which is dangerous, which five, 10 years out, they are going to have trouble, and it's not inconceivable, but it's still be a very small part, uh, that they'll have a hard time adjusting and they may even default. So what I'm going to present what I would say is, is the economist answer which is forgetting politics. Why is it, how would you actually do it? And what you would do is that you start from the equation for that dynamics, which basically say that uh, change in the debt ratio, the ratio of debt to uh, GDP uh, depends on two terms. The first one is interest payments, or more precisely, and here I'm going to use a bit of algebra, which most of you are probably familiar with, uh, it's R minus G times B. So the two adjustments you have to make when you write down the equation is you have to look at the real rate of interest, not the nominal one. Uh, and that's the first correction you should do. And you should take into account that if there is growth, then the debt ratio will increase more slowly. So the first term in the equation is R minus G times the debt ratio last time. And then the other, 
is the primary balance. And the debt ratio will increase if the primary balance is less than interest payments defined as R minus two times mean. So you start from there. Uh, for those of you who have seen the equation, I suspect that's well known for the others you can probably imagine. And then you say, OK, so these are going to be the dynamics. What's going to happen in the next five, 10 years? So what has been done for a long time, you say, well, I think the interest rate is likely to follow that trajectory. So for example, you look at the yield curve and you use the implied interest rate. You make assumptions about the growth rate. So the growth rate is going to be 2.5% over the next five years. Uh, you make assumption about implicit liabilities. You say, oh, the social security system is going to run in the red. Therefore, there have to be transfers of the central government account. You take this into account. So you look at all the things which may affect the primary surplus or the primary balance. And the first step is you just do this, and then you get some trajectory for the debt ratio over the next five, uh, 10 years. That's step one, and that has been done. This is fairly standard. It's called uh, uh, the debt sustainability analysis, and that's standard fare. What you have to do, however, is to go further than that and take into account the fact that there is a lot of uncertainty about all these variables. And so what you have to do is what's known as uh, stochastic uh, debt sustainability analysis, in which you say, no, I'm just not going to look at most likely or the expected value of the rate, but the whole distribution, you know, how likely is it that the rate will be 1% uh, or 100 basis points higher next year or 100 basis points lower. Uh, you're going to do the same thing for growth. You're going to do the same thing for primary balance. What, you know, that might well be a recession, run-of-the-mill recession, that's going to affect the primary balance. And you basically carry the distribution of all these things. And what you get five or 10 years out, is a distribution for the debt ratio, distribution for the deficit ratio. And there you can ask, okay, in 10 years, what is the probability that the debt ratio is on a steadily increasing uh, trend? And then you start worrying. Or instead, you find that the debt ratio is, you know, probability that the debt ratio increases, uh, is still increasing 10 years out, is less than 1%, then you don't worry too much. So, you know, as an economist, not being in Brussels, not being a, a bureaucrat, that's what I would do. Right? And then you know, we have the tools to do it. It makes, you have to make many assumptions, but what forecasts are about assumptions, but your assumptions have to be explicit so they can be discussed by people who don't, who don't like that. And that's, I think, one way to proceed. And even if I do not convince you that that's the way Brussels proceed, uh, I think that's an exercise which I have carried out when I was at the fall, which I've carried out since then, which is precious because it really forces to, you to think about the uncertainty. It forces you to think about the implicit liabilities. Uh, it forces you to think about you know, what the recession implies from the primary balance and so on. Now, when you do this, in the current environment, so that's point four, one of the answers that you get is so I was talking about methodology in point three, but I'm not talking about actual conclusions that I've done it recently for a number of countries. But the first thing you see is that if what worries you most, and I think what worries people most, is that the interest rate may increase a lot. That for some reason, we don't believe interest rates are going to remain low. Um, then what worries you is what would happen in that case. And what would happen in that case is that interest payments of the debt would certainly go from very low to potentially very high, requiring much larger primary surpluses, which you may or may not be able to do uh, given, um, given the political uh, constraints. So think in that context of two ways of preparing yourself for that. The first one is you try to decrease that. So you decide, okay, that is too high, say 100% or more. And so we're going to go for a period of fiscal austerity and we're going to have surpluses 
And in five years, if we really go at it really hard, uh, we're going to go from 100% to 90%. Well, the problem is that that's not going to change very much the amount of interest payments you have to make if the interest rate increases by 300 basis points. All you have done is reduce them by 10% of the total, which is very small, right? I mean, if you have 100% debt and 300 basis points, this is a 3% increase in what you need to find. If by hook and by hook, you decrease that to 90%, then you have 2.7% to find, which is better than three, but is not. So the point is, when you start from very high debt, fiscal austerity is not going to solve your problem. And it would be good to have less debt, and if you go good 40%, it would be great, but basically that's not where you should basically put the effort. Where you should put the effort is in thinking of contingent scenarios, credible contingent scenarios in case rates increase. So you have to be ready basically with something which says credibly, if rates increase by 100 basis points, then the primary surplus or primary balance will be improved by 100 basis points on 1% of GDP, and therefore we'll be able to uh, avoid the debt explosion. Uh, something which is going to give you a lot of leeway in doing this is the maturity of the debt. If the maturity of the debt is one year, then you have to do the adjustment in one year. If it's 10 years, then you have 10 years to do the adjustment, which makes it you know, economically and politically much, much, much easier. But the conclusion is, and again, you know, there are four uh, papers by me and by others, uh, is that basically if you want to reassure investors, you have a choice between two things. Doing fiscal austerity, we need to reduce that, and we will reduce that. And probably by implication, if the ECB is at uh, lower bound, effective lower bound, we get more employment. Or I basically introduce a credible commitment, which is that if the rates increase uh, and that translates into higher interest payments over time, I would increase the primary balance by, say, an automatic increase in the VAT or something like this. Okay, that will have much more effect on the probability of sustainability, probability of default, uh, than, than the decrease in the debt from 100% to 90%. So this is. I think when, when you do those exercises, that, that's what comes out, and clearly it has uh, some, some, some implication uh, uh, for, for, for the design of the rules. Okay. So, again, being an economist and not being uh, uh, you know, a commissioner, uh, I uh, Wrote with uh, Jerome Zettelmeyer and uh, Alvaro Leandro a paper which argued that that's what should be done. And being slightly aware of the real world, we thought about well, how could it be done you know, by Brussels, uh, not just in the abstract. So, this is what uh, has been, I think, has become known as the fiscal standards uh, as opposed to the fiscal rules. And the fiscal, let's say, something like I think I've written it somewhere. I mean, you have it in Article 126 uh, of the FEU. Member states should avoid excessive government deficits. So it's a fairly general statement, right? And then the question is, how do you assess that? And there, what we argued is that there should be, in effect, an SDSA, a Stochastic Debt Sustainability Analysis, which should probably be done both by a national entity and the Commission. So the existence of fiscal councils makes a lot of sense in that context. They have the tools, or they can have the tools to actually do it. The Commission can do it. They can agree, disagree. They can be more optimistic about something. But basically, this is a process where the technocrats you know, come in and do the best they can and discuss assumptions and so on. At the end of the process, they agree, or they don't agree, but they agree that Commission, basically something needs to be done, that the government of country X is on a path which with some probability is going to be an issue. So they basically say to the government, well, we think we should do, you should do that, or at least come back with a proposal which makes sense and avoids the issue. 
Now, the government is typically not going to be terribly happy with that, so there has to be some appeal process, uh, some discussion process, but appeals process, in fact. And there we think that it can be done in two ways, none of them perfect. The first one, it can be done by the Council of the European Union, the way it's done now, uh, that has the advantage of giving you know, democratic uh, uh, support to the decision and the governments which decide which probably is, is the way it should go. The other is to improve the economic side of the European Court of Justice. And the state the European Court of Justice is not having into economics, but it, uh, you could have judges you know, saying to the Commission, well, your case is not strong enough, or it's strong enough, in which case the decision is taken. The advantage of this is, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, American uh, uh, judicial system, is that doing, having this done by a court of justice basically built uh, jurisprudence. So, you know, they do it, they have to, it's exactly as the, like the Supreme Court does it, which is that over time, a body of jurisprudence is built and becomes more and more of a reference uh, and makes the uh, fiscal standards idea, which is a bit fuzzy to start, uh, much more specific in what it implies. If you do this for the European, uh, for the uh, European Council of the Council of, of, uh, of the EU, uh, sorry, Council of the EU, uh, then you're not going to get this jurisprudence because this is a political uh, entity and you get politics. Again, there are advantages to this endorsement of a, of a decision, but I think that there's a trade-off. Anyway, we argued that if Brussels was ambitious in reforming the rules, this is uh, what, what, they, what they should uh, explore. Uh, I think we are aware that this is a long shot. This is uh, a fairly dramatic change in the rules. We don't think it needs to be a change in the treaty unless there is a shift from uh, the uh, Council of the European Union to the Court of Justice. Uh, but, you know, we say we are economists, this is how we think it should be done. Anything else is not going to uh, be as, as, as good, as useful as this. Now, again, uh, I've been, you know, I've been at the IMF, I've been advising government, so I know the constraints, and I'm quite sure that moving from fiscal rules to fiscal standards is going to happen, uh, which is sad, but this is the reality. So the question is, what rules are going to be kept? And if rules are kept, well, how should they look like? And clearly, this is the subject of your series of, uh, of, of Zooms and, and video conferences. I want first to say two things. There's a number of people who say, oh, are very complex, they should be very simple. And that's a fool's heron. There's absolutely no way to design simple rules. You can design simple rules going back to point two, but they're going to work very badly. Uh, you know, black zero is, about, I mean, black zero is a rule I can explain to my daughters, uh, but that doesn't make it a good rule. That makes it a simple rule and a very bad simple rule. That's a non-starter, uh, because the issue, you know, from my discussion in, 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 in point uh, three, is that, you know, what is sustainable depends on the very large number of factors which are very specific to the It depends, for example, on whether Mario Draghi is prime minister of Italy or not, and th things like this. And the notion of a simple rule, 3%, 16%, like zero, is going to do the job. It is going to do the job at the cost of the economy, which is probably not what, what we have in. And the other end, you have people who say, well, complexity has to be recognized. We were too simple, 3%, 60%. That was too simple. And, you know, we've added basically complexity over time. And I assume that, you know, uh, you, you are very much aware of the degree of complexity of the current rules. Uh, I think I understand that but I think I'm part of a very small set of people who do so. And 
you know, you can see the attempt, which is that they have realized that these rules were too constraining and so, uh, and, and therefore had to be cheated, you know, that was cheating. So they have tried to make the rules sometimes a bit tougher, sometimes a bit weaker in order to avoid the cheating and so on. And the result is a complete mess. Uh, just totally incomprehensible. So the notion that you can basically write rules which are sufficiently complex uh, is also a fool's errand. There's just no hope. If you go that route and you start again with simple ones, you'll complicate them and complicate them and complicate them to the point where they just don't make any sense. So you have to accept the fact that it has to be not too simple, not too complicated. In doing so, it's not going to do a as well as what I suggested in point three. It's sometimes going to basically force a country to do something which is suboptimal. But, you know, if this is the constraint we take, they have to be not too simple, not too complex. Now, where should they go? So again, I'm still going to have my hat as an economist and basically look at the dead uh, uh, the dead dynamics. And basically it says that is sustainable as long as you can generate a primary balance, which is sufficient to cover interest payments defined again as R minus times B. So in particular, if R minus G is uh, negative, so the interest rate is less than the growth rate, then you can actually run a primary deficit. Uh, and separately, you might even be able to run a primary deficit of more than 3% uh, without having to worry because basically uh, the uh, R minus G times G is even more negative than that. So what should you do? I think that the rule should be a rule which relates the required primary balance, not to the debt as it is now, but to the debt service, right? Basically it should say if the debt service is low, you can have a primary deficit if the debt is if the interest payments defined my way are high, then you should basically move to a primary surplus. You should not do this overnight. There should be an adjustment over time, uh, but that the fundamental variable that you need to basically react to is not that, it's debt service. And in a world in which we've moved from, you know, interest, pay, interest rates, real interest rates of 5% to minus something today, right? Then you know, the difference between trying to achieve some debt level or some or react to debt service is completely different. So I think the, the main answer there is that if you're going to have a rule, make it basically a primary balance as a function of the uh, debt service rather than debt. Debt should matter a bit because if you just do it as a function of debt service, there's a chance that debt is going to basically do a random walk and just move around and maybe increase a lot. So there should be some feedback on debt, but it should be much weaker. It would be one twentieth of the difference between 60% and the actual number, for example, uh, than it is today. So if the EU came up with something like this, it would make me fairly happy. Not totally happy, but fairly happy. I get to the last point. I'm afraid that the EU is not going to do that. Although, if I were, you know, in your shoes, I would fight for something like six, uh, which is a rule which is smart, uh, not perfect, but smart. Uh, I have spent the last few weeks talking to a number of policymakers. I, I was in Europe and uh, I talked to some of them and that by Zoom, and. I think I see the writing on the wall with fairly high probability, which is a return, a formal return to 3% and 60%. Uh, with probably a bit of accommodation, so some of the junk which has accumulated over time, maybe thrown away, maybe the 1 /20th, uh, uh rule might be suspended or could take into account the fact that monetary policy cannot help, so it might be different. Uh, if uh, the ECB cannot cannot help. In exchange for this, so I, I don't think this is good, I think it's too stringent, okay. but in exchange for this, I think there's an increasing desire, uh, 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 because politically it works well, to do a separate capital account uh, where you do green investment 
and you finance it by debt. So this would be a way, this would be a way of at least allowing for green and having more debt uh, than than would be on the 3% and 60%, but the debt would not show up in the national accounts necessarily, or if it showed up, it would be separate. Uh, and this might satisfy the people who think that green investment is needed. Uh, is it a good compromise? No, I don't think it is at all. Uh, the notion that because it's green investment, you can finance something by debt, makes no sense from a debt sustainability point of view. Uh, if you do green investment, but it does not increase fiscal revenues, it does not necessarily increase growth, it may growth better, then from a debt sustainability point of view, it's exactly the same as paying public employees. That shouldn't have a pass because it's green or because it's investment. Now, if the investment yields revenues to the state, or increases growth and therefore increases revenues indirectly, sure, that should be taken into account. But the notion that there would be a pass, uh, a debt pass for green investment, is, from an economic point of view, a very bad idea. Unfortunately, from a political point of view, uh, it may be a much better idea, and I worry, therefore, that uh, this will happen. I think I've made my main points. Uh, and I'm now happy to answer any question which comes my way. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm not sure to understand very well. Uh, are you totally uh, against the uh, green fiscal rule of, of, of not? No, no, absolutely not. I'm oh. against the, the notion. So I'm very much in favor of green investment. Although I don't think that's the only investment. I think there should be inequality investment. I suspect there are other types of investment, uh, education investment. Uh, but no, I'm very much in favor of public investment in all these fields. And this should happen independent of financing. The criterion should be, is the social rate of return adjusted for risk sufficiently high that it's worth doing, namely that it exceeds the rate at which government If yes, it should be done. Then there is the issue of finance. You can do it entirely for debt or you can do it for taxes. There, I think, is where debt sustainability becomes an issue. And I'm not ready to give a pass, do it entirely by debt, to any uh, public investment project. It may well be, and that's a discussion in the U.S. today, it may well be that we need a lot of investment and in the U.S. we need even more than in Europe. Okay, But it may be that from a debt sustainability point of view or from a macro stabilization point of view, uh, the two are uh, it should be financed, say, two thirds of taxes. Okay. Does this answer your, does this answer your question? Yes, 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 sure. Thank you. Um, Chris, uh, I, I don't see the, the chat. Uh, there are no questions in the chat for the moment. OK. I have maybe another question. Um, how it's possible to explain the, the same story to Belgium or to France and to Netherlands about the criteria? It's a problem today, a political problem. And how the, an economist can explain that it's not the same story for the Netherlands that for the Belgium or for, uh, for France or Italy or Spain? So I think that's where you want to distinguish between making sure that there is no debt default and what policy you want to follow. So it seems to me that in terms of discussion of you know, are any of these countries running into the risk of debt default? That's a technical discussion, right? And we may come to the conclusion that, you know, none of the countries basically uh, is at this stage uh, likely to, to default. Now, it may well be that once this is done, you know, Italy decides to have a larger primary deficit and the Netherlands decides to have a larger primary surplus. 
and that's fine with me. But I think we have to separate out what is optimal fiscal policy, which might be very different from one country to the next, to something that we can agree on because it's a factual discussion, which is, is the path of debt in country X sustainable or not? Now, we may disagree about the definition of sustainability. We may disagree about the dangers. It's, you know, maybe I found that people who are more hawkish tend to put a very high probability on a major increase in interest rates, right? So we may disagree. I may say, no, no, I think the probability of an increase in interest rate is not zero, but it's, you know, whatever it is. And then somebody would say, no, 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 I know that tomorrow morning uh, interest rates are going to triple. That's a discussion about assumptions. Maybe we come to an agreement, maybe not, but that's a discussion which is, you know, a technical discussion, not a value discussion. The optimal fiscal policy is very much about values, right? I may decide to have a big state. I may decide to have a small state. I may decide to have a very generous state. I may decide to have a less generous state and so on and so on. I may trust my uh, politicians more in one country than in the other. All these things matter and determine why, you know, Germany of the Netherlands should have, want to have, could have, uh, a much tougher fiscal policy than Italy. But, but as long as Italy, you know, takes decisions which do not put into questions their debt sustainability, then they should be allowed to do it. So, I, again, I think we agree, we disagree in, in Europe about what the optimal fiscal policy is. You know, I have probably have a much more interventionist view of what the government should do than some of the Eastern members say. Uh, that's fine. That's not what the discussion is about here. Okay, thank you. Chris, you have a question? Yes, there is a question of Stefan. He says the budgetary rules are already very opaque, but won't it become entirely impossible to explain the rules to the public when they become based on stochastic analysis? Might this not increase the divide between the European institutions and the population, especially when countries need to pursue austerity? Yeah, I, that's, a, that's a good question. But, you know, the, basically, you have to start from a fact, which just is not going to go away, which is that, that assessing that sustainability is not something that the man or the woman in the street can do. It's a very complex exercise in the same way as creating a vaccine against COVID. You need basically people, experts, technocrats, right? So that job has to be done. Now, if they come out with some recommendation, they have to be able to explain as best as can be why they think that is sustainable or not sustainable in the same way as you know the council the COVID councils basically try to explain that based on what they have seen then we should you know you know we should immunize the uh, the kids or not so i think we have to accept that there are many decisions which basically cannot are not simple and cannot be explained in very simple terms that's fact. Uh, um, I think what has to be done is basically there has to be trust. So I think that independent fiscal councils are the essence. And when I see a threat to a fiscal council, I start worrying. Uh, the commission has to have trust. There are going to be discussions. But in the end, you know, why do you trust your doctor? You trust your doctor because you, tr I mean, you, you trust the answers because you trust him. And I think the same thing has to be true here, which is this is a very complex exercise. The reasonable people can come out on one side or the other, uh, but in the end, the exercise has been done, you know, fairly objectively. And these are the conclusions. Then you take it from there. Okay. There are some more questions that are entering now from Alex yeah, Reuter. In your model, is there an impact on the ECB's policy or on its mandate? Uh, no, I mean, there's no, it's not, 
part of my proposal, but uh, you know, I think the ECB should, well, the ECB should do two things. Uh, clearly, if there is very weak private demand, uh, it should try to get the rates as low as possible, subject to the uh, effective lower bound. Uh, in addition, in sovereign bond markets, uh, there are, uh, as we know, uh, sudden stops, which is that even if fundamentals are okay, so the sustainability analysis has concluded things are okay, investors may react uh, to nothing, to some spots, get scared, get out, require a spread, and make that which was sustainable unsustainable. So this is something which has happened to emerging markets. I think in this case, the ECB has the ability to step in and basically buy the stuff that the uh, scared investors are selling. If it is true risk, namely the investors see that, you know, there's really an issue of that sustainability and try to get out, the ECB cannot do anything. The only people who can do something are the government. But if it is occurs a case of nerves, right, then the ECB has stronger nerves than the investors. It can basically buy. And as long as the investors know that the ECB will buy, they actually don't sell because you only sell if you're worried, right? Mm -hmm. But if you know the ECB is going to maintain the low rate, you don't sell. So I think the ECB has an important role to play in that context. Uh, and I think it has played it uh, a number of times, you know, whatever it takes from Mario and the intervention uh, at the beginning of COVID, uh, they are going away from the uh, from the, uh, the key uh, and intervening more in some markets than others. So I th that's how I see the role of both the ECB and, uh, mm -hmm. and national governments. There is another question uh, of Professor Heilen. Um, for what reason are you worried that interest rates may rise? There is uh, the long run downward pressure on interest rates due to aging, rising inequality. And if higher growth is the source of rising interest rates, it shouldn't be a problem then. That's a very good question. I've, I'm finishing a book precisely on that issue, uh, which is what is behind the decrease in interest rates and what may happen. And my conclusions are indeed uh, similar to that of uh, Mr. Helen, uh, which is, I think that this is due, you no, know, it has been going on for 30 years. It has been going on. Uh, it's not the global financial crisis. It's not the COVID crisis. They're just little bumps. Uh, that has happened in, Europe, in Japan, in the US, largely independently. So it's really very deep forces at work. And I agree with uh, what uh, is in the chat that uh, I think demographics uh, tend to lead to higher saving and therefore lower rates. And that's not going to turn around. That's going to be, uh, uh, that's going to play more and more for all. I also think that the demand for liquid assets and the demand for safe assets has increased for a number of reasons, and that's not going to turn around. So my expected value is indeed that the rates will remain very low and lower than the growth rate. Uh, indeed, if the growth rate increases and that tends to increase the rate, although historically the relation is not very strong, uh, then there is no problem as well. I mean, the interest rate, the R minus G may remain to say. Uh, I had one more point that I wanted to, yes. So this being said, my expected value is exactly like uh, that in the chat, but solutions. And I know that things can happen. And so I think that the probability that they remain very low for very long is not one. And I have to think about it because over, even if it's 90%, which I think it's roughly bad for the next uh, five, 10 years, there's a 10% chance that R star, the, uh, yeah, the neutral interest rate, increases quite a bit. Where would this come from? Could come from a number of places. It could come from uh, higher investment. I think that there is a non-zero probability that green investment, especially if it's publicly mm -hmm. subsidized, uh, will have big effect on private investment and is going to lead to a lot of technological progress, a lot of investment. I have estimates from 
other researchers that this could basically add 2% a year, 2% of GDP uh, over the next uh, uh, 20 years. Uh, if this is the case, then clearly the interest, the equilibrium interest rate would be higher. Uh, the other is fiscal policy. I mean, you know, I have no doubt that the Biden stimulus in the US is going to lead uh, to higher rates for a while and very strong aggregate demand. So it can happen. Uh, it was intentional, whether it was a good idea or not, I'm not sure, but it was intentional. Um, and infrastructure, if Congress, US Congress passes both the reconciliation bill and the infrastructure uh, bill and they're largely financed through debt, then that again uh, may well lead to a higher interest rate. So again, I suspect that we can work out under the assumption that rates will remain low. And if you have a maturity of 10 years for your for you know, eight years for your average maturity of eight years for your uh, sovereign debt, then even if the rate goes up a lot today, it's not going to affect you very much for a while. Uh, and I think that has to be the working assumption, but you have to be ready with a plan B in case. And I think the people who say, just ignore it. Well, we'll see what happens. It will not happen anyway. Uh, are, are fooling themselves and taking a risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is another question of Edward Rosen's or a remark. Uh, he say, and can we expect the technocrats who will perform the stochastic debt sustainability analysis to be really independent? Uh, the political pressure will be enormous to not be a country with an unsustainable debt situation. Because if you are, the political consequences are severe. Yeah? Lower expenditure, right. raised taxes, etc. OK, I mean, that's, that's a good question. I think I have an answer. I've been at the font for eight years and we sometimes said things that governments didn't like. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had a discussion and sometimes they basically convinced us that, uh, you know, we had not taken into account something. But very often uh, they did not convince us. And then the article for the report of the fund on the country uh, was fairly tough. Uh, I would say, you know, if I look at the IMF, the number of people who are going to be swayed to basically say nice things uh, is, is very small. So you have to create similar structures. Uh, uh, the Commission, I think, is relatively independent. Uh, national f fiscal councils can be very independent. I mean, they gave uh, the example of New Zealand in a paper I wrote. Uh, in New Zealand, there's a fiscal council, and the fiscal councils say, look, this is not good. Uh, now, what happens is not the end of the story because the government comes back and says, okay, well, first, I don't believe it, but given that you say that we have to do something and they propose something, you know, we're going to basically, as a result, increase some rate or decrease some spending. And then the fiscal council says, well, if you do this, you know, things look better. Yeah, I mean, the issue of independence of technocrats is always there. And, you know, recently there was an event at the World Bank uh, about the independence of the World Bank vis-a-vis -vis China uh, and being willing to change some ranking uh, to be nice. It's going to happen. I don't think it's a it's a it, it's a major issue. Having been at the IMF, I can assure you that I said many things which uh, probably did not uh, play well in a number of countries. Uh, but you know, my future did not depend on those countries, and I felt I could do it, and my staff could do it. That was not an issue. But yes, you have to design the, the governance structure of the Fiscal Council in a very careful way. Mm -hmm. OK, Professor De Koster asks, uh, how does the definition of sustainability based on probability of default deviate from the definition based on satisfying the intertemporal budget constraint? For given values of I, G and D, one can easily calculate the value of the primary surplus that satisfies the IBC and the intertemporal budget constraint. But this is an adjustment of the PS which can be postponed for some time. How can one be sure 
that financial market participants will stay convinced that there is no risk of default. And the reverse, Belgium does not satisfy the condition of sustainability based on the IBC for many years, and still there is no market reaction. Um, technical response first. You can do it in two ways. You can basically write down the intertemporal budget constraint, fill it with the information you have, and find out what primary balance you need today. So that's a complicated uh, computation if you want to introduce uncertainty. I did this in a paper on not the uh, uh, government uh, balance, but on the current account balance. And I found that it was technically difficult. I find it easier to say, if we're going to do this, then at some stage debt will explode, which is another way of saying the IBC will not be satisfied. So this is a purely technical issue. But I think in terms of explaining it's much easier to explain that, you know, if you keep doing this, you're going to get to a point where there's no way you can actually uh, uh, stabilize the debt. But we can discuss it. And if uh, Mr. De Costa is interested, I can send him the paper on, on the current account. So that's the technical issue. On the Belgium computation, I suspect that that would be a case in which I would conclude that uh, the IBC is actually satisfied with very high probability. Uh, you know, I would like I would like to see uh, what the uh, assumptions are for R and G, and uh, implicit liabilities, and, uh, and 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 primary deficits, and then see whether this leads to that explosion. I have not done it. He may be right, uh, but typically what happens is. You know, many of the European countries, not not this year, not last year, because we understand the deficits were enormous. But suppose we go post COVID, uh, many of these countries intend to run primary deficits which are smaller than 2%. And I don't know what it is for Belgium. But uh, so if you do this, then the debt ratio is going to decrease with very high probability because what you're getting from the other term, R minus G, so R is more or less a zero nominal rate, 2% inflation, say, so minus 2. G is, say, 2%, so R minus G is minus 4% times the debt of 100%, so that's minus 4% of GDP. As long as the primary deficits are less than minus 4% of GDP in expected value, the uh, debt ratio will decrease. Now, with uncertainty, there's always some chance that it will not. But my sense is, again, uh, you know, Belgium, I, again, I don't know enough about the numbers, but if you tell me Belgium is going to run primary deficits of 3% over the next 10 years, I would say, you know, probably no reason to worry. Not saying it's good. I mean, I, you know, I suspect Belgium should probably have lower deficits than that. EVCB can help. You know, sustain activity, but that's not the issue. The issue is you know, are they getting in trouble? So again, you know, Belgium. I don't know the numbers, so maybe it's much worse than I think. But on the technical issue, IBC versus debt simulation, that's conceptually and technically the same thing, but one is more complicated than the other. Uh, and uh, on Belgium, you know, I'll do my homework. Okay, um, perhaps there is a, one more, but you answered already some uh, uh, points, but I, I read it. Um, Oliver Malay says, thank you for your very insightful speech. I have three questions. How many parameters would you include in the analysis? A lot or a few? And two, do you think it can lead to clear conclusion? Or would the uncertainties of the future parameters lead to too much ad hoc debates on these parameters? And three, do you think the interest rates will rise a lot in the next years? Okay, so on three, I've, you know, I've, I've talked. Uh, I suspect that in the very short run, we'll see a, a, a decently large increase in interest rates in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I don't think that will be the case in the uh, eurozone, but so mm -hmm. there'll be a bump, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to have a big effect on the budget because again, the maturity is long and the long rates are not moving much, but short rates are going to go. Uh, on the others, yes, I mean, when you do an SDSA, you have to make many assumptions, you know, assumptions about the distributions, I mean, and things like, do you assume a normal distribution, say for R minus G, or do you assume a fat tail distribution is going to make a difference. So you have to make an assumption about the distribution. Um, if you're thinking about, you know, probability of a recession, run of a mirror recession, then you need assumptions about what this is going to do to automatic stabilizers, how this is going to affect revenues and spending. So yes, uh, all these assumptions uh, are going to be needed. Uh, how many? I don't know exactly how many parameters. Uh, but yes, any such exercise is going to imply a lot of assumptions because the world is the world. If we didn't need to make assumptions, I would make assumptions. But this is a very difficult issue. Uh, there is uncertainty about some parameters, about some distributions. So that's just a way of starting discussions. But again, I have done it. I've never at the fund we didn't didn't do it as ambitiously as I'm describing, but we had scenario discussions. So it's kind of uh, kind of a, a simplified version of of, of sustainability of that of sarcastic uh, that sustainability analysis, and it led to incredibly interesting discussions. You know, if somebody said, "Well, I think growth is going to increase by two percent," then they had to explain why. If somebody said, oh, but the interest rate, you know, is going to do that, they had to explain why. And that discussion itself was useful. It's a way of thinking rather than, oh, did they do 3%? No, they did 3.1%. Oh, let's start, you know, a, a procedure. They go from preventive to uh, to whatever, uh, corrective. Uh, that is simple. <laughs> but simple can be stupid. And uh, that's the point. Ok, voilà, président, je pense qu'on a presque tout parcouru. Je pense qu'on a, 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 a couvert pas mal de terrain. Ouais. Tout à fait, et puis vous êtes allé un peu sur le, le, le côté politique, parce que évidemment, en tant que représentant des partenaires sociaux, on sait qu'on ne peut pas être qu'académique, donc il faut aussi approcher une solution, des propositions qui peut, puissent être politiquement acceptables, et c'est toute la difficulté, évidemment, du débat aujourd'hui. C'est pour ça que je vous ai un peu taquiné sur comment on pouvait expliquer euh, entre guillemets, la différence entre les Pays-Bas euh, et la Belgique, alors que nous sommes deux économies qui sont collées une à l'autre, nous en plus. Hein, donc euh, la comparaison est encore plus difficile. <rire> il, y a, il y a certainement des différences importantes de, culturelles, hein, qui sont euh, par exemple l'attitude vis-à-vis de la dette. Moi, je suis très frappé. Enfin, une grosse partie de mon travail depuis quelques années, c'est d'expliquer que la dette ça n'est pas nécessairement une catastrophe. Mais pour un certain nombre de gens, on démarre là. Mais euh, donc, il y, a un travail, il y a un travail pédagogique à faire, mais ça ne suffit pas. Euh, il faut ensuite faire un travail politique et voir comment, euh, si on a réussi à faire bouger un peu les gens, les amener à des solutions qui sont meilleures que celles qu'elles auraient choisies autrement. Euh, Évidemment, en Belgique, nous avons, euh, comme l'Italie, connu évidemment ce qu'on appelle l'effet boule de neige de la dette hein, dans les années 80 et les années 90 que ben, d'autres pays européens n'ont pas connu. Donc, l'emballement de, de la dette publique, ça a été à un moment une catastrophe et ça a entraîné des politiques d'austérité très, très fortes dans les années 90, évidemment. Donc, Absolument, mais les taux d'intérêt étaient sans rapport avec les taux d'intérêt d'aujourd'hui. C'est pour ça que la question sur les taux d'intérêt est absolument centrale. Mais c'est vrai que... Les gens se rappellent des épisodes. Enfin, on sait que les Allemands se rappellent l'hyperinflation. On sait que euh, l'Italie se rappelle, euh, se rappelle les, les crises de dette. Et euh, l'environnement est différent, mais euh, il ne faut, faut pas oublier les, les, les leçons de l'histoire non plus. Et, et donc, ce que j'essaie de faire quand, quand on parle comme ça, c'est d'avoir un message qui est plus ouvert à l'utilisation des déficits de la dette, euh, mais essayer d'éviter les, les extrêmes, parce que j'ai de l'autre côté. D'un côté, j'ai... Euh, j'ai blague zéro, il y a des gens qui croient que la dette est une catastrophe, est un, est un péché énorme. Et de l'autre côté, j'ai MMMT, 
qui sont les, cette école qui est aux États-Unis, explique que les déficits n'ont pas la moindre importance et que de toute manière, on s'en fout. Et donc, il faut trouver à la fois du point de vue économique et du point de vue politique la niche au milieu. Ce n'est pas évident. Mais puisque vous enfin, parlez de la... Je vais me permettre une dernière question parce que vous parlez de la nouvelle théorie monétaire euh, oui. euh, qui fait beaucoup... Euh... Enfin, beaucoup de responsables politiques en Belgique la réutilisent, évidemment, pour dire que le déficit oui. ne compte plus. Or, oui. euh, c'est quand même fortement une analyse très américaine par rapport à la réserve fédérale américaine. Est-ce que vous pouvez Ce n'est pas une analyse très américaine, c'est une analyse très fausse. Elle est fausse, elle est inacceptable du point de vue logique. Et je comprends parfaitement comment certains politiques là, sont prêts à accepter. Ils se contrefoutent du raisonnement. Ils aiment le résultat. Mais il faut le dire, c'est logiquement euh, faux. Euh, et donc, il faut se battre contre ça. Donc, il faut se battre contre sa droite et contre sa gauche. Mais il faut être absolument explicite. Parce que cette littérature, ici... Et c'est vrai que les conneries arrivent souvent aux États-Unis. Oui, oui. <rire> okay. Malheureusement. Voilà. Président, il y a encore quelques questions qui sont arrivées. Uh, so, Chris Saroyan from ACV, in your recent paper, you added the proposal of this paper would mark a large departure from status quo. They would require treaty change. Realistic? Question mark. No, I think I think requiring a treaty change is not realistic, uh, and uh, we think that it can be done uh, without changing uh, a treaty. Uh, so, a three percent, sixty percent could stay. Uh, but, you know, the interpretation of this would be that these are useful numbers and we try to get there in some way. Uh, yeah, and that's for lawyers to discuss. But anything which requires a treaty change, I think, is, is, is you know, for the moment out of the question. Yes, the question by Thomas Kroos is correct. It's true in, true in German as well, right? Okay. Yes. Schultz, yeah, Schultz, yeah. Uh, Edward Rosens, uh, also a question from FAB. Is the big fundamental discussion not the one on the quality of spending? Regular spending reviews necessary? The smartness of taxation? No, I, that's wrong. It's a, it's a fundamental discussion when it comes to national fiscal policies, right? I mean, in, mm -hmm. in my country, I want to know whether we're not spending too much on this or too, too little on that. Right? Mm. Are we, you know, are we paying teachers enough? Uh, are we paying nurses enough? Are we paying some too much and so on? That's fine. That has nothing to do with EU rules. Okay. Only to the extent that the decisions we take have an implication for that sustainability. Should this be taken into account by the EU rules? Countries should be free to do stupid stuff. Right? And they do stupid stuff. That's their right. That's what democracy is about. What they should not do is do stupid stuff which puts others in, in danger. That's what the EU rules are. Okay, so you may have a government which basically does much too much, in your opinion, but you know has balanced budgets. Okay, in this case, you may not be happy with the outcome, but you have nothing to say, or Brussels has nothing to say. So Yes, it's a fundamental discussion. Is the state you know, doing the right thing? So it's a much bigger question. But for the question that you asked me to talk about today, that's yeah. not the question. OK. Ah, il y en a encore une, Chris, je pense. Encore une de Stephen. If different rules apply to different countries, according to the stochastic model, won't that lead to frictions between countries within the EU? This could happen when, for instance, smaller countries without a safe haven status might be forced more quickly than bigger countries to take measures. So there are two parts to the answer. First one is the same rules would apply, namely the way to do a stochastic DSA would be well established. You know, these are the steps you have to go. Through. The results would be different, obviously, right? And it may well be that for a country which is not as credible as another one, the conclusions from the same promises by the government may actually be different. So, for example, I may trust, 
you know, the Minister of Finance of the Netherlands, say, or Mr. Uh, you know, uh, of the Minister of Finance at the, of the FDP, who is going to be the Minister of Finance in Germany, I may trust him more. And therefore, the very fact that I trust him more, in, even if the numbers look the same as Italy say, which they don't, I will trust. Right? That's part of what it is. And that sustainability with the same numbers, but a crazy person in charge or a very responsible or hawkish person in charge has very different implications. So yes, I suspect that because of the history of Italy, the, the history of Belgium, they will, you know, for the same apparent set of numbers, uh, get a slightly less favorable assessment. You pay for what you've done. Ah, moi j'entends plus. Ah oui, pardon. Ah, ben, voilà, ok. <rire> Merci en beaucoup. Tout. Je pense qu'il n'y a plus de questions. En tout cas, il me reste à, à vous remercier, en tout cas, pour euh, vraiment l'exposé et la franchise de votre propos, parce que je pense qu'aujourd'hui, on a besoin un peu de savoir où on va. Euh, et je pense que c'était euh, extrêmement intéressant, extrêmement franc, euh, entre guillemets, sur les positions que, que l'on pouvait prendre. Et euh, je vous remercie encore d'avoir passé un peu de temps euh, avec nous euh, à travers l'Atlantique. Euh, hein, euh, pour, euh, pour nous informer à propos évidemment de ces révisions sur euh, les règles budgétaires. En tout cas, une, une bonne journée à vous. Je pense que vous, la journée commence. Merci. Hein, à Washington. La journée commence. La journée oui, commence. voilà, nous elle finit. <rire> Donc voilà. Donc en tout cas, une bonne journée, un hein. grand, grand merci et bonne soirée à tout le monde euh, ici en Belgique en tout cas. Merci. Au merci revoir. Beaucoup. Au revoir. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir.